presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you everybody for being here, my golly. Um, so I just, you know, anybody that isn't, hasn't joined us, I think what we just do is we get started since it's recording and we'll let Emma take it away when she's ready and she's back with her chopsticks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've, I've got my chopstick. It is so okay. cold and so dry here that I feel like I'm just like a sponge to any um, liquid right now on my body. <laughs> yes. So, well, so I'm here. Time of year. Yeah. So Emma, go ahead. We're going to let you take it away. Would you, okay. before you get started, um, I would love for you just to give everybody a little bit of your background and yeah. not only with feeding, but just as an OT in general and as a person and as a therapist. Um, and then we'll just let you, you take it away. That sounds good. I have a little introduction on the side, but sometimes it's nice to see the person that's talking to. Um, so I will introduce myself a little bit here and a little bit on the slide. But my name is Emma. Like Cindy said, I'm a pediatric occupational therapist, um, have been for about five years now. And Cindy, I was thinking, has it been since April, May that I've I been with this. McKibben and Monty? Yeah, I would say on, I think it was almost May. I think it's been five or six months at this point, um, yeah. which is wild. So I'm, I'm relatively new, but I feel like I've been with McKibben and Monty for a little bit now. Um, outside of McKibben and Monty, I work in an outpatient um, pediatric hospital setting. So I have experience right now with that, um, but also experience with acute inpatient rehab in the adult setting, skilled nursing facilities, um, but pediatrics is definitely where my heart is. Mm -hmm. I'm on the Cleveland team and I'll pull out my screen so you can see where my heart is also <laughs> um, here. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the Cleveland team. Um, this is my husband, Blake, and then our son, Brooks, who's now 10 months. Um, and then our daughter is 16, right down there in the corner with the four legs. Mm -hmm. um, we live in the Cleveland area. My husband's a resident in the area. We lived here about four and a half, five years now and are just starting to feel like it might be home. Um, so we're really excited, although it's pretty chilly. <laughs> we could do without that. And professionally too, um, feeding is one of my areas of passion. Um, I, I wanna say growing expertise, and I have my professional development listed here, advanced training in the SOS approach to feeding. I have a certification in that model, which we'll go into. Um, I just took a course in the AEIOU model of feeding, which we'll also talk about. Um, I have my advanced certification in DIR floor time. Um, this is an approach that's up and coming. It's newer in the literature. It really supports more so the neurodivergent or the autistic population through a play-based approach as opposed to the compliance-based. Um, and this afternoon, I actually just signed up for a new course um, regarding feeding. It's uh, called Get Permission Approach. We'll talk a little bit more about it, but I wanted to learn more. So right. when I'm not learning and when I'm not trying to advance my education, um, I'm with my family right here and we are hiking and outside and just enjoying each other. Mm -hmm. So we will go ahead and we'll get started. I just want to thank everybody for filling out that poll that I had sent out last week. Um, it was really helpful just to get an idea of the information that I can kind of tailor to tonight's presentation. I will try and be concise, but this is something I could talk forever about. Mm -hmm. So I'm always available if anybody has any questions, but one of the questions and comments on the poll was what is feeding therapy? And in short, it's just getting kids to eat, um, but in a pleasurable and successful way that it's going to be positive, that kids want to eat out of intrinsic motivation or it feels good to them, um, out of intrinsic desire to fulfill a need of hunger, thirst, or that social engagement, as opposed to a compliance-based way like a clean plate club or you have to eat x in order to get y so just making this a positive and successful mealtime experience it's one of the things that happens so frequently in our kids and our families' lives that when it's not going well it can really impact a lot of things outside of feeding as well so with feeding therapy there's a lot of different ways to go about it um I, I don't want to say that there's a wrong way with an exception to one, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit, but there's all these different approaches. And in the poll, it sounds like this SOS or this sequential oral sensory approach is the one that we're most familiar with. Um, it was developed by Kay Toomey, who's a pediatric psychologist. 
And her whole concept is using systematic desensitization in a way that's responsive to the kid and respectful to the kid and their need and going at their own pace. So flooding and using these techniques to show the kids the different sensory experiences of the food to prime or get their body ready to figure out, okay, what is this food going to do in my mouth? I can touch it. I can smell it. I can taste it before even chewing and swallowing. And I can understand if my body's going to be ready or not. She also does feel very strongly that there are 32 steps to eating. Um, and within these 32 steps, I actually want to pull up a little handout, which Sarah will be able to send out um, after this presentation. But I just want to show these 32 steps because a lot of times, can you guys see this handout okay? Um, a lot of times parents are like, well, my kid's not eating. Well, yes, they may not be eating, but where are they in this 32 steps to eating? So this approach really focuses on these areas. I don't like the word tolerates, just personal preference. So I like to use accepts. Are they accepting the food in their area? Are they interacting with the food in their area? Are they looking at it? Are they willing to move it with a spoon? And we have this area further developed um, into some subsections as well. Then moving up, is the child able to smell the food? Are they able to smell it in the room, at the table? Are they able to lean forward to smell it? So it's the pro this progression to get closer and closer to the face. And again, the whole idea of this is that it's responsive and it's respectful for the child's pace. So we are never going to jump up to taste if the child's still down here to interacting with a spoon. We're always going to meet them where they're at. So yes, we're using more of an approach that is flooding um, and systematic desensitization can typically get a bad rep um, in the psychology world, but this is a respectful and a responsive approach. So moving through these different steps is one of her big hallmarks of her approach. Just gonna go back to my presentation. One thing too that K2Me really emphasizes is matching the child's cognitive and developmental age to the level of food exploration in our intervention. So she talks about in a lot of the population that we're working with, this two to five-year-old range, they're magical thinkers. So if they say, oh my gosh, there's monsters under my bed, rather than saying, no, there's not, no, there's not that black and white thinking, you better be making monster spray to tap into that magical thinking to get rid of those monsters. So just like there's monsters under the bed, there's also monsters on the plate. So when these kids are truly worried about the food, when they're truly not able to accept it in their space, using play and tapping into their cognitive and developmental age is gonna be the biggest bang for our buck through this approach as well, as opposed to, oh, you're fine, it's just broccoli, just broccoli, just taste it. One of the biggest things too, and that we'll see across all of these different approaches is that active involvement of the caregiver and the parent is essential to all of this because feeding happens at home more so than it does with us. Another approach is this AEIOU approach. Um, I recently took this one. It is extensive. It's a big time commitment. Um, she actually has a course coming up that I'd be happy to send out a link for. It was probably one of the best courses I've ever taken outside of feeding therapy as well. So I highly recommend anybody who is interested in some continuing education and looking into her approach. Um, she is also focusing on responsive feeding and being respectful for the pace of the child. But Nina Johansson really delves into the impact that the relationship has between the child and the caregiver on their mealtime. So she looks at Specifically, and I'll pull up another handout, this acceptance. How is the caregiver accepting their child in their child's picky eating? When we think about feeding, because it happens so often in our day-to-day -day life, it's a stressor for parents because they're probably getting pressure from the pediatrician for weight gain. They're getting pressure from maybe the other caregiver in the home of, oh, Johnny just won't eat. It's your fault. Maybe the in-laws, maybe the other family at the holiday gatherings are giving them more pressure and it makes the parent feel poor. And then in turn, that can really impact the relationship that the parent has with the child. So then it's just this cycle of pressure, pressure, pressure at mealtimes. And as we'll talk in a little bit, that's really not going to be supportive for the child. So 
through this approach, I, one of the things that I really like about it, and I would recommend that we as therapists through McKibbin and Monty kind of shift our focus to with feeding is this acceptance because we, we have the parent buy-in. Parents are coming to us with a genuine interest in a buy-in for our services. And so if we can partner with them to figure out what is happening at home in mealtimes while supporting the child in the setting that we are, I think that we're going to get a lot deeper of an intervention and a more long-term success. With this approach too, doesn't mean that we can't focus on feeding while we're talking about acceptance. It's just this stepwise process. So I'm going to pull up another handout. I apologize that I'm kind of jumping back and forth, but I'm visual. <laughs> um, and the AEIOU to me just sounded like vowels until I took her course. So can you guys see this, this form okay? with the puzzle pieces. Okay, so Nando Johansson just breaks down the AEIOU and we can talk more into it. I just wanna be cognizant of everybody's time as well. But she has these questions just to think about. And again, it's a hierarchy. So when we first meet a family, yes, we're gonna support the child with feeding in the daycare, in the preschool and the home, wherever we're seeing them. But in our minds, we're gonna be working through this hierarchy, trying to figure out where the root of the feeding problem is. A lot of times in the SOS approach, we'll focus on the child solely, saying maybe the child has a picky eating problem, but sometimes like Nina Johansson is emphasizing, it could just be this dyad between the caregiver and the child creating pressure during meals that if we can alleviate some of that pressure, the child might be more intrinsically motivated to eat because when we take that pressure off, we're gonna feel a little bit more competent and that we have more control in our environment. Not saying that's everything, but it's one of the biggest things that she's been focusing on. Um, and in her research and her clinical experience, she's actually had a lot of kids that in her practice, she has not addressed feeding, but she's addressed this acceptance and it's made a world of a difference. So it's, it's pretty interesting. We'll still address feeding again, but thinking about this stepwise. So acceptance again, thinking about that relationship between the child and the caregiver. Exposure, which I think is a light bulb moment for a lot of families, the child has to be exposed to the food that they want them to eat. We can't expect a child to eat broccoli if they're not gonna be exposed to broccoli. And sometimes, ironically, that's going to be one of the barriers is, well, I want my child to eat broccoli. Okay, well, how often are you being exposed? Never, they're never gonna eat it. Well, <laughs> How can we accept that or expect them to eat it if they're never gonna have it in front of them? And even thinking through those 32 steps, there's a lot in between from the plate to their mouth. So bringing in that exposure within a responsive and respectful way. The I in this model is independence. So how is the caregiver promoting independence through the child's mealtime? But then also for the child, what about their self, their development, their health, their temperament, any kind of preference is getting away of their independence. A lot of times, especially being as an OT, that's sensory processing, that's some of that tactile input that we're not a fan of on our finger. So it's teaching them some supportive strategies in here to be more independent. The O is the observation. So thinking about is the, these mealtimes should be social. You know, we, we learn, like I talked in this lunchtime learning that I hope you all were able to listen to, feeding is a learned response. So we're not gonna learn how to do it unless we have a model. Sometimes just with life, we don't have models for our kids to eat. So we're getting them a piece of broccoli, but then nobody's sitting down to eat that broccoli with them. So they're looking at it like, what is this? I don't know what to do with this and I'm just not gonna do it. So if somebody is able to sit down with them and at least model um, and share a mealtime with them, that can be supportive as well. And then last, again, because this approach is responsive and it's trying to be respectful to the child and their cues, is there good understanding between the, the parent and the child in one another's cues? Sometimes there's a misinterpretation of stress responses. Um, I'm working with a particular child right now that he likes to leave the table Caregivers were receiving that as, well, he just, he's not hungry anymore, but it's, it's actually a stress response. He's being presented with foods with an expectation that he consumes the foods when he's not ready for. So we've talked about, okay, what, what are this child's cues that we can look for to help him before he feels like he needs to leave from the table? 
and focusing on that as well. So I'm gonna go back to the presentation. I'm sorry again that I'm jumping, but I hope that this makes sense. <laughs> okay. The skip promotion approach is another approach that we can take. Um, I would be happy to share more information as I take this course. It's a self-study and I'm going to just delve in as much as I can. Um, but her, it's Marsha Dunn Klein. She's an occupational therapist known as the grasshopper therapist. Um, I, I looked into that and I've heard that term before. I'm not sure if anybody else has, but there's a story that she got into feeding in this field um, after her and her family and her boys went down to Mexico. And they were at this food cart and the gentleman selling the food off the cart gave her this food. And she's like, I don't know what this is. And they looked on translate and it turns out it was grasshoppers and guacamole. And she was like, well, when in Mexico, but she realized that I'm not just going to take this grasshopper and put it in my mouth. She took it between her fingers. She kind of rubbed it together. She realized that it's crunchy it's making noise, it's breaking apart. So that's probably how it's going to respond in my mouth. She saw when she broke it apart, it got kind of squishy, not to be gross, but squishy on the inside. So she realized, okay, maybe when I take a bite, things are going to squirt out. How can I maybe mask that feeling with extra guacamole? So she's working through this process all while realizing, whoa, our kids are eating grasshoppers every single day you know, that pepper, that broccoli, those, those foods that they're seeing as scary are grasshoppers that we're needing to help break down from a sensory perspective or a scientific perspective to figure out what are the food properties of this food or what are those sensory properties of this food and what's going to happen when I do explore it more and I put it in my mouth. So long story short, the grasshopper therapist, which I thought is a really nice analogy sometimes for families to understand um, and again, she just wants to build a foundation of positive mealtime experiences and more to come on this approach after I take her course, but stay tuned. <laughs> and I don't like to say that there's a wrong way to do things, but um, I think through talking with a lot of different therapists and with McKibben and Monty, I think a lot of us are on the same page. And actually, if we look at the research a lot of insurance companies um, are are seeing this as an incorrect or maybe a not so great approach as well, which is a compliance-based or behavioral-based approach. I will be honest, before OT school, I was an ABA therapist. I thought that's all there was to help kids. So I did it, it didn't feel right, but I thought that's what there was. Um, so now I've, I've learned and I'm excited to share a little bit more about why we would probably not take this approach. Um, living in the Cleveland area, I will tell you that there are behavioral based approaches and clinics in our area that are still seeing kids that seemingly are successful because these kind of, pro of programs are focused on data. And it's really easy to get data and a quantity over a quality. You can get really quick short term success seeing a child take 10 bites of a piece of broccoli when you're in their clinic. But then when you go home, they're not carrying that over because it's only under certain contexts and it's only with certain reinforcements. So in this cycle, I just want to think about why we probably will not want to use this behavioral based approach. And I don't want to tell anybody what to do, but strongly encourage when a child or anybody will start up here is given a task that's required compliance. You're being told what to do. Our child, our children, especially with feeding, are unable to perform this task due to their own individual factors, whether it's an oral motor deficit, whether it's a sensory processing preference, whether maybe it's a language understanding, maybe they're not even you know, ready to smell this food yet. They're, for some reason, they're unable to perform. They're gonna get stressed. They're gonna feel, oh gosh, well, my, my iPad is on the line. My Oreo is on the line. What do I do? I don't know how to do this. I don't want to do it. They're gonna get stressed. And from a biological standpoint, when we get stressed, our hunger cues actually turn off. It's, it's, a, it's a saving mechanism that our bodies have. So when we truly are under stress, we don't have to think about our lunch. We can just focus on what's being stressed. But then when we're not hungry, we don't have hunger cues, why are we gonna wanna eat? So it's just this vicious cycle again. So then when we're not hungry, we're not getting cues, well, the task is still there. What do I do? What do I do? And you, these kids are just constantly going through the cycle 
until the point of, I just have to comply or I have to use my behavior to get out of this. And the behavior to get out of it is usually worse than the picky eating. Hmm. So this is why we tend to not want to use this approach. We want this approach to be positive. We want it to be play-based. The positive play-based, responsive, and respectful approaches do take a lot more time because you have to build the rapport. You have to really understand the child. You're not going to get quick short-term success like you would if you're using a high yield reward like an Oreo or an iPad. But building that relationship, those skills are a lot more transferable. So when the child goes to a birthday party or out for dinner or the family gathering at the holidays, they're able to use the skills that they learned from you at those places, even if that reinforcement's not there. So what we see a lot is with these tasks and with these approaches, if the reinforcement's not there, then I'm not going to eat. You know, if, if our paycheck's not there, we're not going to work. I'm going to go hang out. Mm-hmm. So thinking about that with feeding as well, just, just a nugget, but this is one of the approaches that we, we definitely want to stay away from. Mm-hmm. Any questions so far? You want to pause? I can't see anybody. <laughs> I can see Cindy. There's, there's a lot of people on here listening to you, Emma. <laughs> You're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. And I, and truthfully, I think everyone is essentially muted. So that's probably why it's very quiet. Okay, um, no, that's perfect. But if you have a question, I think we can do a, a chat as well. Okay. On that sounds good. If I, Yeah. If anybody has any questions, just feel free to put it in the chat or interrupt me. Um, but I will keep going. Um, with feeding with McKibben and Monty. So Cindy and Leah and I have met several times um, and we had a really great feeding questionnaire prior to this discussion about the feeding program. Um, And after my course with that AEIOU course and really thinking more about that parent relationship and the impact that has on a child's feeding readiness um, and they're willing to eat, we've revised the feeding questionnaire to reflect um, a lot more of the parental concerns Um, And I'm just going to pull that up real quick. And I believe, I think it was Sarah, I want to say, um, who did use it. Um, One of the, I want to, if she's on, I'm so sorry for butchering it. I just emailed you. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Um, Great. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, so we had talked earlier and she had used it with one of her, her children and she said it worked really well. So as people are using this, I'm, we're really open to suggestions. Is everybody able to see this? Okay. Okay. Um, so just going through the, the caregiver questionnaire, the way that this would look is our children, when they get referred, um, they're going to go through the typical screening process with a speech or an OT, um, but then with feeding as well, we're also going to have the dietitian to try and figure out, is it more the OT realm, is it dietitian realm? The caregiver or the parent is also going to be requested to fill out this questionnaire. So if we, if any of you have done this before, it may look pretty similar. I've added a couple different things like how was the child introduced to table foods? Um, what we're starting to see is that that can have an impact as well. Um, and then thinking about, again, that acceptance, adding questions of, does your child's pediatrician have concerns for weight gain? So is there pressure externally on this parent to feed their child? So I will have Sarah um, send this out through email and we can put it on Google Drive so we don't have to spend a ton of time going through it. But going through each different sensory experience, thinking about when their strong food preferences began, um, and then again, where they're eating and trying to get a holistic picture of what's occurring here. Referral comes in, so you've gathered all this information prior to going in for the assessment. Okay. Correct. Yeah, what I had done with mine, and this was a whole learning process for me too, what I had done with my, um, my client that I'm seeing right now is I just went in with, the regular OT screener. And I, I've kind of been building this feeding questionnaire as I've worked with him. So again, I'm open to any suggestions that anybody has. Um, Another suggestion that we, Cindy and Leah and I had talked about was 
getting, once the rapport is built with the family and the caregiver, asking them to send you a five or 10 minute video of what a family meal looks like. We want to wait until rapport is built because we want to see actually what's happening and not just this makeshift, everybody be on your best behavior, we're recording type of meal. We want to see truly what's happening in the mealtime so we can give a little bit more insight as well, because as we know, kids behave better for us than they do their own parents. With the intervention, um, there's no, we have to use any certain approach um, with exception to that, a compliance-based approach through the poll. It sounds like a lot of us are familiar with SOS, um, but I do recommend focusing on that 45 to 60 minute weekly spot. Um, I like to call these sessions food parties, it gets kids more excited than we're gonna learn about food and you're gonna try and eat it. So we do food parties um, for direct intervention, but then also having this extra time because the parent education is extensive. Um, I have developed several different parent handouts that I like to call as quick grab and goes that I'll show you um, to hopefully help with the parent education, but it does take quite a bit of time to check in and see how mealtimes were going. In this intervention process too, the expectation is that the family provides the food options. Um, I have requested and it seems to work well and I'm open, open to suggestions as well, but sending two to three novel or non-preferred foods and then one to two preferred or familiar foods. You always want something that the child is aware of and that they're familiar with just to have that safe kind of backup. Um, but then again, to push them. They're in feeding therapy for a reason. So we want those novel or non-preferred foods. With the SOS approach um, that a lot of us are familiar with, there's an idea of food chaining or picking foods that are similar to the last food that you just had. Um, so for example, thinking about you know a veggie straw and then moving over to those harvest snap peas that look kind of like a veggie straw, but they're green, but then maybe to like a, a sugar snap pea, like a fresh one. SOS or that approach says, let's food chain, let's build off from a sensory perspective. I think for this purpose, do what feels best. For my family that I'm currently supporting, I'm just having the mom send in any novel or non-preferred foods. I think it's a lot to ask these families to build these chains for us or go buy a certain food. So what the particular family that I'm supporting, she'll just go through the week's meals and say, hey, I think, I think my child's gonna have a difficult time with the chicken. I'm gonna send a little bit of chicken so he can learn about it before the full meal. So kind of go at what you feel like is gonna be the best for your, your child and your family. These are a couple screenshots of some handouts that I've used. I'll, I will share as well. Um, this My New Foods is a placemat that I've actually laminated. So then we have somewhere fun to place the food. Um, in SOS, a lot of times people will call it like a learning plate, but we just call it a little placemat. For documentation purposes, it's quick and it's efficient for me to bring this printed off my new food chart. In my sessions, I'll actually write down underneath this column of new food. I'll write the, the novel prefer the novel, excuse me, foods, and then the preferred foods as well. And then my child actually likes to make smiley faces. So he will make smiley faces for every box that he gets to with no pressure that we're getting up to chew, but just as far as he can get to. So again, these are those six subsections of the 32 steps to eating. So it might be helpful, I can send all of this out to have both of those with you to kind of break down, okay, where are we at? And because it's play-based, I have a spinning wheel that sometimes we get stuck and my child says, I, I don't know how to explore and I don't know if I'm ready to go more. Well, we spin the wheel to see, okay, well, it landed on ears. Are we ready to listen to it? Okay, if we're not ready to listen to it, what can we do? So it just gives us a little bit more of a playful approach too. I'm happy to share. And in addition to the, the My New Food chart, I do tend to email the family weekly just to check in and say, how are the meals? What has happened this week? Any stressors outside of mealtimes that I should know about that might be influencing? So again, that's built into that 45 to 60 minute weekly time. That's really valuable to these families. Emma, we had a question in the chat. I think yeah. you answered most of it, but Bryn was asking, um, so are we required to provide the foods or should parents provide them in a lunchbox to have at school that we have access to when we see them? How does that work? Yeah, so 
I think with the, the family providing all the food options, what I have found that works the best is my child's mom actually emails me the morning of and says, Hey, so-and-so is bringing X, Y, Z for his new, for his new foods. And then a and B for his preferred foods. And she'll just quick send me that sometimes her life has just gotten busy and she's put it on a post-it note. So the expectation is that the family brings, but have the family let you know what's preferred or not preferred. Initially, I had no idea and he was eating everything. I'm like, well, what are we doing? So it, it is helpful to have the family divide out what it is preferred or non-preferred for the particular child that I'm seeing. We were very nervous to start food parties. So the family actually bought a brand new lunchbox specifically for food parties, which has worked well because this child also brings his lunch. So the lunch box, the lunch lunchbox and the food party lunchbox are two separate lunchboxes. So different ways that we can go about it, but absolutely the family is gonna bring the food options. Did that answer your question? Unmuting. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I was typing and it'd be easier to talk to you, but I didn't want you to hear the um, roars of my children in the background. Um, the, <laughs> um, some of the schools have lunch provided and things like that. And it's kind of like most of them have you, the parents want the kids to eat the foods there when they're paying for it. So <laughs> they just want them to like, it's that whole, not peer pressure, but just like, oh, this is what's the expectation of sitting on the carpet. This is the expectation of how you use glue. This is the expectation of this is what you eat at lunch. And for sure. so it's that whole, like, do you incorporate um, just with this setting with McGibbon and Monty, it's a little different with like the preschools and daycares and we're do, providing so much in the, in those settings, like, are, do you, um, how do I phrase the question? Do you, are you providing like guidance to the teachers on like, this is what they should eat or shouldn't eat or like within their lunch time, their snack time, or are they getting everything separate based on their feeding therapy timeline? Because a lot of times what they're on a different, they're on a different, um, like uh, there are different different goals, different things like that. So I don't know if you did something completely different for them or yeah. if they're like trying to follow what the class is doing with like a side of therapy during that time, or are you providing actual therapy during the meal time if it allows? Does that make so, sense? Does that make yes. Sense? Okay. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yes to all the above. Okay. <laughs> um the the particular center that I go to, they don't provide lunch. So the families provide lunch. The centers provide snacks. So I have done the the lunch being individual um, with this particular child, but then I've also gone in during snack times just to see, okay, what's being offered for a snack? Is the child eating the snack? What's being offered? And is what being offered something that he would accept? Because he's going to need to eat. And so if it's cucumbers and saltines, those are two foods that my friend is not familiar with and my friend is not ready to accept yet. So it's it's teaching the teacher then within their capacity because they're busy, how can we present these foods to this child in a way that he's ready to accept it? So what he actually does is he puts gloves on and he hands out all the snacks to everybody. Because in that 32 steps to eating, he's just that interacting with and he's just that accepting it in his space. So with handing out those snacks, you're getting him to touch it, which is another step. And then, like you said, it's that positive fear pressure where I have a job, I have a role, I feel important, I get all this attention, I'm going to just keep doing it. It's that positive reinforcement. So does that kind of make sense? I think, I think yes, absolutely. Thank you for clarifying. It was just trying to figure out that the model of what we're doing, like, mm -hmm. and, um, first, like with going, I'm just picturing going in, working with them because I've done private therapy and, and like clinical setting where you have them in a room and you have much more control over what they're eating and things like that. Uh -huh. A lot of parents, the feedback I'm getting from parents is a lot of like, well, I want them to eat what everyone else is eating, like what they're served and what they're given and da da da. And I totally agree with that. And, um, 
as I've, my own child has gone through schools like that, where this is the food they're getting and they want them to eat. And so they're like, can they eat something? And they, there's four things on the plate, but I want them to eat one of the things. But how you clarified it is important. Like, and literally on the, the thing for my child yesterday at one of the schools we service was cucumbers and saltine crackers. And I'm like, mm, uh, that's not going to go over well with a lot of kids, let alone some of our feeding clients. So that mm-hmm. made sense to me that like uh, how you explained it. Um, and I think it's okay to have that expectation too, that the kid participates in the snack time. Like that, that's just life. That's just how it's going to be. We're going to go to outings where I'm not going to like every food, <laughs> but maybe that's where we have the discussion with the family and the teacher of, okay, can can Johnny have one food that he's familiar with? So he's at least getting something in his belly for a snack time. Mm -hmm. That's taking away some of that stress that is not eliminating that hunger cue. So he's getting something that he can eat, whether it's Teddy Grahams or whatever family can bring while the expectation is we're going to learn about the foods. Does that make sense? Yep. Right. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay, great. Um, I want to just to be respectful of everybody's time. I want to go just quick show these different handouts that we had created. Oh, my screen sharing is paused. You've got the 32 steps of eating. It That's what we see on our screen. Let me close. As you're after yeah, COVID, just, I would figure it out. <laughs> let me just um, share with you all that that I know that Emma's talking about that forty-five to sixty minutes. We actually have made OTs. We've made that feeding contract a sixty-minute contract um, purposely because Emma lo- kind of learned the hard way <laughs> with her <laughs> first plan how much time it really does take. And as she said, that education piece, as we want to make sure we incorporate. Um, in all of our therapy, but particularly in this feeding therapy, um, you know, she found that there was so much time that was really spent on emails to parents and making sure they understood where we were and answering their questions. So that contract is a 60 minute feeding contract and you have 60 minutes, um, not only for the direct one-on-one, but also the education for teachers and, and parents. And what I'm hoping to, through learning through my mistakes, is I've actually taken a lot of what I had emailed this mom or wish I would have had created. And I created these, excuse me, handouts for you guys that we can distribute. So feel free to read through these on your own time. But a couple of different areas that are really important are positioning for feeding. Um, Are kids well supported in their seat? So they're able to sit. tell his parents what is good positioning, but then also, you know, we're not all going to have these beautiful, expensive chairs. What can I do to my own dining room chair? So some different recommendations, but on all of these handouts, I have a disclaimer of please consult your feeding therapist. So it's not an end all be all. It's just a little guidance. So positioning for feeding, I have one mealtimes and structures, um, the expectation that children are going to sit, that there's no distractions or tablets. We're not coercing the children to sit, just going through those developmental expectations for a mealtime routine, mealtime structure. And then the big question is, well, my child needs their iPad to eat (laughs) and why, Mm -hmm. why we would not prefer that to happen, um, from a neurological and a biological standpoint, but then also, thinking about, I, I even pulled in some research articles of why, why we would prefer that not to happen. Um, I don't give any strategies here because that is typically a multi-facet issue. I did say to eliminate the device usage, please consult your feeding therapist. So if there's anything that you guys want to problem solve together, I'm here, um, but no straightforward strategies on that one right there. I have also created um, a mealtime anxiety. When we think about that stress, we want to eliminate the anxiety um, around mealtimes. A lot of the anxiety stems from parents bribing out of a great nature. I've caught myself even trying to do it with my own son at 10 months. I'm like, come on, just eat more chicken. And I, I do this for a living. So it it's all out of good nature, um, but it's also a really good reminder of how our behavior is influencing the whole feeding realm as well. Um, some different strategies, but again, consult your feeding therapist. Mm -hmm. 
Another handout, this is one I talked about in that Lunch and Learn. It's that division of responsibility. This is one that I, again, all of these will be sent out, but I really like to highlight because I think a lot of times, especially in this new gentle parenting realm, it's, well, the child's in charge. The child gets to choose what they're going to eat. Well, that that's not the case. This division of responsibility is saying that that can actually fuel a lot of this picky eating. What we're going to say is the child is responsible for how much and whether they're going to eat. The parent is responsible for what they're going to eat, when they're going to eat, where. So the, ch- the parent's going to provide the food with an understanding that about 80% of the food is familiar food or food that the child's going to eat because they have to have volume to grow. But 20% is going to be new and it's up to the child to decide how much they're going to eat and whether they're going to eat it. So that eliminates the coercing. It eliminates the bribes. It eliminates the distractions because a lot of what this research is starting to say is if we shift our responsibility to whether the child's going to eat or how much they're going to eat by numbering bites or so forth, they need responsibility because at this age, they're looking for independence. So they're going to shift their responsibility to what, when, and where. And that's where that picky eating can really, really get started. So again, all shared, but my hope with these is that it saves you guys time and we learn from my mistakes. <laughs> um, I think those are great. I, I love that you put that together. Um, and I think that those we'll put those all on our Google Doc, but it's a perfect way of... Um, I mean, I feel like we've got such a nice, well-rounded program and to have those and have consistency with the way we're doing it is phenomenal. Um, I'll let you go into goal writing, but those are, those are beautiful handouts. Thank you. I, it's nice to hide. I just, I like efficiency. So if there was any other topic that anybody wants, I'd be happy to work together and build one. Um, just a couple goals. Again, I don't like goal banks, but just some different goals and some different words um, and verbiage that we can use. Personally, I, I tend to stay a little bit more strength space and positive in my goals as opposed to tolerating or dealing with certain foods. So you'll see a lot of accepting. So we'll demonstrate carryover. Um, they'll advocate for their sensory needs or their preferences and the goals. And then the documentation process as well. So I put in typically what my notes look like um, with obviously the child's name taken out, but in the objective, I know typically we let that be the goals carried through, but this is where I like to list the food. And I put without therapeutic intervention, the child was able to do X, Y, Z. And then the X, Y, Z, this is where I put those steps to eating. So for example, without therapeutic intervention, I'm always able to look at the goldfish. But with therapeutic intervention, I was able to smell and take a bite of the goldfish. So showing to families of this is where your child started and with a little bit of push and help while being responsive to them, they were able to achieve this. And with feeding therapy, there's, there's an end, there's a goal in mind. So here's some discharge readiness that we like to guide our intervention by. Um, and this is recommended by that SOS approach or k 2 me, the, the pediatric psychologist. So thinking about just being able to accept and taste a novel food when they're being presented, our goal is to not have a child love every single food that's just not realistic for anybody. Um, but being able to have 80 to 90% of the foods that they're being presented across all of these different settings. We wanna think about at least 30 different foods in their repertoire because that ensures that the child in, in quotes here can go through two full days without repeating a food. We wanna stay away from that because if a child's only gonna eat the same food every single day, they can get burnt out on it and drop that food. And if we drop that food on an already limited repertoire, you really have slim pickings for other foods that you can pick. So having enough to rotate through is going to be beneficial. And again, obviously we want our kids to grow. So the weight and height growth curve, having enough fluids, and then also being able to consume age appropriate foods without having those aversive responses or refusals. So just wanna say thank you. Feeding can be very fun. Um, it's one of those things that happens so much in our day today that when it's stressful, it can really impact a lot more than just feeding. And I think that, especially in our setting, we have a really, really nice impact on our families in a, 
a good buy-in on them naturally. So I think that this could be a really great program for us. Emma, thank you. I that's that was fantastic. Um, just to sort of piggy, I, I want you all to an, to ask questions of Emma, but just to piggyback on that and just to kind of give you the big picture. Really, you know, we had asked Emma, and that this is her specialty. I know a lot of you OTs and even speech pathologists, we have some experience with feeding, but we really felt as if we needed something that, again, we had a consistent way that we are approaching these kids. And um, we know that there's the need out there and that we've got more and more picky eaters, right? In these busy lives, parents are um, are really being frustrated, or frustrated and overwhelmed with this. And so um, our intent in having Emma present to us tonight is that it would give you all the knowledge on how we like to proceed and the protocol that we like to use um, and providing you all with resources and that knowledge and maybe filling in some of those gaps and in, in areas that you didn't feel as comfortable. Um, Emma is, you know, she can be a mentor to any of us um, and is willing to support us as we take on these kids. But we really, Jenny and I really would like to roll out this program and present this now to our daycares and let them know that we actually have a feeding program. Um, so it's not gonna be just Emma that's doing these, which we've kind of limited kind of to the Cleveland area and Emma's little territory. Now we'd really like to roll this out and make sure that you all are comfortable enough to be able to take on kiddos as well in all of our territories. Um, so I know it doesn't, you know, it, it, for a lot of us, it's, it, it, or for a lot of you as OTs, because it's going to be primarily the OTs that are working with this, um, it will take some practice and you might not be really comfortable with it at the beginning. But again, I think Emma will be, or I know Emma is, is um, offered to be here and help support us along the way as there's questions and you're approached with kids that, um, you know, that you're not as familiar with as we start this process. I'm, if there's, I am going to let you ask questions, but I also, before anybody jumps off, I would love to use this as an opportunity to introduce you to our new dietitian. Beth, I believe, can you show your face? You are on our, I think you are still on here. Um, we are thrilled to have a new dietitian, um, Beth, who is from the Cleveland area, and she is going to be kind of filling that place we had um, in the past. You probably are familiar. We had Kelly Ackert who was kind of that nutritional dietary um, consult um, for families that needed that support on ensuring that our kids are getting a well-rounded nutritional diet, um, sort of helping not necessarily with those sensory kids or those picky eating kiddos. Um, I'm sorry, did I say Cleveland? I meant Columbus. Sorry, Beth, you're from Columbus. I always say Cleveland. Jenny will tell you that just because it's where I'm from. <laughs> Um, Beth is actually from Columbus. Um, anyways, Beth is, um, we are thrilled to have her on board and she is, um, maybe you want to just give a little bit about your background real quickly, Beth, and introduce yourself. This sure. Might be a opportunity. Sure. So I'm a dietitian. I work at Ohio State. I've worked at Ohio State for um, a long time, 30 plus years. I do nutrition and cancer research. Um, so we do a lot of human clinical trials in lots of different cancers, high-risk breast cancer, prostate cancer. Um, we do a lot of dietary pattern research. So looking at, um, you know, different macronutrient compositions and how those might influence biomarkers associated with cancers, different cancers. Um, so this is a little bit new to me. I have to tell you, Emma, I really learned a lot today. This was fascinating. I kept thinking this is just a completely different area. And I wish that I would have had this when I, my kids were young, this would have been really helpful. So I really am grateful to be on board with this team. And I'm looking forward to certainly more of these continuing education opportunities. This was really interesting. Great. Thanks, Beth. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we run? I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Hi, Sarah. Hi. So now that we have Beth, like I just, I have an established feeding client that I've been working with for a long time now, but I'm about to start a new one that I just screened. Should I have brought the questionnaire to Beth before setting goals? 
Um, I, I don't think that we, I mean, I don't think we need to necessarily change okay. where we kind of insert dietitians and where we insert Beth. Um, I think we all, you know, you know, your wheelhouse as an occupational therapist is different than a dietitian. We need Beth to help guide. For instance, I just got a referral or an inquiry from Cleveland actually today about a, a grandmother that's really frustrated because her two-year-old is eating the same food all the time. But then she sat him in a new place today and she told me he ate 10 helpings of this meal that she made for the entire family. I'm like, oh, bravo, that's great. Why don't you talk to our dietitian? I think she might have some really good suggestions because she said weight is not a concern, but she's just concerned. She just wants to make sure he's eating the right foods. So from my perspective, that's a great place for Beth to get involved. It doesn't, now that might, Beth might get involved and find out that it's more than that, but I would love Beth to do it, to do a consultation with this family, which we've asked for, they've asked for. But, um, so my point is, if you feel like that family could benefit from some nutritional advice um, and above and beyond kind of that picky eating realm, then absolutely recommend that. And we can have Beth do a consultation. And I guess for this specific screening, one of the parent concerns was appropriate water intake at meals. I don't know the specific norms on water intake for, I think she's three. So is that something, Beth, that I could reach out to you about? Sure. Yes, okay. absolutely. I'll email you. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And I just saw another chat um, that was about a concern about dysphagia and a child that has a history of dysphagia. Um, in, in a situation like dysphagia, obviously it becomes much more complex. Um, we typically, and I think that was you, Elaine, um, we typically, I've been confronted with one of those in Columbus um, that, but the child actually, it was not in daycare regularly. And um, in the case of dysphagia, obviously we need to look at the MBS and we need to make sure that we understand really what's going on with that swallow. So I think if those cases were to come our way, um, you know, I, I think Emma probably would be a good one to guide or any, you know, we can, we can kind of problem solve as a team, but maybe go to Emma and ask her how she would suggest we approach it. Um, I also have some experience with pediatric dysphagia, so I'm happy to help in those sorts of cases as well. Does that help, Elaine? I don't know if it you're does. Thank of, you. I didn't know if you were thinking of a specific case, Elaine, um, or if you're just saying in general when those cases come our way. Yeah, in general, just if that were if we're opening it up to a lot of people know that McKibben and Monty are servicing more for feeding issues. I just kind of wondered if, you know, that might bring, I haven't had any situations with where we're encountering that, but it could happen. And I just wondered kind of how we would, would broach that if, um, you know, from a safety <laughs> point and if there were video swallow studies or anything like that. Absolutely. And maybe, you know, if those cases come along, um, Jenny and I can help problem solve with Emma on the approach that we would suggest for those families. But obviously, if, if it's in fact a dysphagia versus a picky eating and actually swallowing and pneumonia and right dysphagia is actually a concern, then that is absolutely something we have to rule out with an MBS. And so um, that would be our first step before we start getting engaged in feeding therapy. Would you agree, Emma? Do you have any other things to add on that? Yeah, I think so in my other setting, it's different, but a lot of times we'll see kids that orally are not ready to swallow food. But again, in those 32 steps to eating, we can work on different steps before we even bring it to our mouth. So when we are ready to safely swallow or we've had that swallow study, we've already primed our body to get up to those steps. Mm -hmm. So we're ready to jump and we're ready to do it rather than getting the swallow study because sometimes with the swallow study, you, you have to swallow. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. if we're not ready to swallow, then it's really hard to, to get that. So there's a lot of different pieces there, but yeah, that, we can still support those kids, I think. I just had a quick question. 
about the referral process, just and you said it already, but if you just clarify, when we do have a referral, um, is Beth always coming in on the referral or is, are we just referring when needed? Referring when needed. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Was on mute or not? Referring when needed. Absolutely. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And in a lot of those cases, you all, we are. Um, Jenny and I are are. Um, you know, problem solving and gathering information before we help. We we often are kind of guiding that referral process. So when somebody, when a child comes with the picky eating, we are. Um, we often, and in most cases, call the parent and try to get a better picture of what's going on as to which way we, if we feel like a nutritional, a dietary consult is a place to start, or if it truly is a picky eating, we usually, then we'll start with um, occupational therapy. And then you all might say, hey, we would like, like to get a dietary consult and that's great. So we're really kind of um, problem solving and figuring out which direction to go from the very get-go. Okay, anything else you all? All right, I think we'll let you run. Um, Emma, thank you ever so much for all your efforts and, and pulling this program together. Um, Jenny and I are very excited about it. I think it will be a wonderful addition to um, the services that we are currently providing. And I am excited, we're excited to see what, what comes and the referrals that come our way. Um, as we start rolling this out and letting all of our territories know that we've got uh, therapists ready to see these types of kiddos. Yeah, thank you guys. And again, I am here in any way that I can. And I'm still learning. So let's stay tuned to this new approach, but um, any, any help that I can be, I'm here. Great. Emma, great job. And thank you everyone for taking time out of your evening to um, attend this um, virtual um, seminar on feeding, our new feeding program. All right. We'll let you all enjoy your night. Thanks again for your time. Thanks everyone. Stay warm. Mm -hmm.